1982 Flying Finn Keki Rosberg won his only World Championship title in this, the Williams FW08, powered by the inimitable 3-litre Cosworth DFV. It was a mighty achievement over their turbo-engine rivals who had significantly more horsepower that season and was the result of now legendary designers Patrick Head, Frank Durney and Neil Oatley extrapolating every ounce of performance available from the chassis and its ground effect aerodynamics. Now as nice it is to know that this car competed in three Grand Prix with Keki Rosberg and had two podiums. The real anoraks among you, myself included, will probably quite like to know what happened at the back of the car at the end of its racing life, because this was one of Williams' experimental six-wheelers. You may remember Tyrrell's six-wheel effort that had four wheels at the front, or well, Williams experimented with four wheels at the back, and the idea was to massively reduce aerodynamic drag caused by this regular-sized standard rear tyre. They were struggling, you see, for horsepower in the fight against the new turbo-powered teams. They were missing about 180 or so brake in 1982. And their calculations showed that if they basically put four front wheels on the back that were obviously much lower profile, the drag reduction was an equivalent to a whopping 160 brake horsepower at the same time as, of course, giving amazing traction. Rosberg tested this car in six-wheel form at the end of 1982 and loved it, just as Jonathan Palmer did over a decade later when taking this chassis to the fastest time at Goodwood's Festival of Speed. It was great fun to throw around to get a bit sideways because when the, when the car started to break away, instead of one wheel losing grip and therefore losing 50% of your rear end grip, if one wheel lost grip, you still had three other wheels giving you some grip. But as the penny dropped with the FIA that six wheels really might turn out to be better than four, they quickly banned the concept before the whole grid would have to radically change their designs. And as you can see from these vast tunnels that allow clean airflow under the car, this was one of the primary ground effect contenders of the era. Now the idea was that the airflow comes in and under the side pods in a very narrow aperture and underneath it gradually opens up allowing the airflow to speed up and that creates a low pressure zone towards the back of the car, sucks the car down into the ground giving it huge amounts of downforce and massively more grip. Now in period they amplified that effect by running side skirts that sealed the edges with the ground. You're not allowed that these days in historic Formula One, but you can have a little bit of a skirt that doesn't quite contact with the ground. And this car was designed to run at the ride height that it actually runs in today. So everything still works and we should feel a fair bit of that ground effect aero on track. As much as I would love to see this car race as a six wheeler in the FIA Masters Historic Formula One Championship today, it was with four wheels that Rosberg triumphed nearly four decades ago, and four wheels, therefore, we've got to play with today. It is so nice to be in a single-seater. Really responsible on the brakes. Brake pedal 
to a stop but this is one of them it's just it's happiness in the form of a race sometimes have to stop and forcefully sort of pinch myself and realize recognize and appreciate what's happening because it's one thing to drive a DFB power Formula One car I've been lucky enough to drive quite a few of them and that's certainly the best of those that I've ever driven but when you then remember the history and so you've got this kind of double layer of extraordinary experience extraordinary honor and privilege on the one hand it's just driving a phenomenal racing car that feels so so pure, so responsive, so alert and alive, very light on its feet in terms of how quickly it responds to your inputs on the steering wheel and the pedals, but on the other hand, absolutely bolted aerodynamically, especially in the quick corners out there. And in fact, down through the Craner curves, which are built up the courage to take flat in top, there's a little bit of a, a stream from last night's rain still running across the road in the dip on the exit but you don't even feel it in this car and visually it looks like there's quite a lot of water and it should snap the car sideways but i guess the ground effect's just really up and running by then and it just it's just nothing it just makes mincemeat of the high speed turns what's nice though in the lower speed turns where the aero is not so effective it's a bit like a cart the driving position is actually a bit cart like especially because you're so close to those front wheels and you're sat up quite high the steering wheels reasonably low compared to more modern single seaters and you really hustle it around but it's very delicate very precise movements and I found that as the laps went on I had to have a little talk to myself just to calm down all of my inputs I think I was being too aggressive and I don't mean that I was chucking the car around I mean I thought I was being precise but compared to what it needs compared to what it likes you have to just accept that you don't need to be heavy-handed you don't need to be heavy-footed even on the brake pedal when you're braking impossibly late it's just beautifully balanced we've got 580 odd kilograms we've got about 500 brake horsepower from the dfv bolted to the back of this aluminium honeycomb monocoque and obviously enormous big wide slicks and loads of aero loads of ground effect and you feel all of those things at work and they just harmonize, they complement each other. Even the gearbox, the five-speed manual, the tiny little throw, you're not shifting gear with arm movements like this, it's tiny little wrist movements, which when you 
get into the groove and you synchronize that with your footwork, with a heel and toe blip on the throttle, on the downshift, it's wonderful because you can brake really late, compress the braking zone very short, and yet still leave a double downshift at the very end of that and just boom, boom, straight down into gear with, without hesitation, without wondering if you've pushed the lever in the right way, without wondering if it's engaged cleanly. Just, it's just magic. Thank you.